The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Dr. Richard Barwell, a developer of neurologically based chiropractic in the NeuroInfinity. Today we have a treat. We have uh, Dr. Joe Demian going to be talking to you about why I became a chiropractor. Uh, just a short, brief introduction to Joe is, is that he represents really, I think, uh, the majority of thinking chiropractors in the profession today where uh, he had some challenges about uh, where chiropractic was going and what it was doing. And because of a friend who insisted that he come and listen to uh, a talk I did, uh, had a, a real shift in his uh, approach in chiropractic and where that has led him. I'm, I'm very proud to uh, be associated with Dr. Demian. I think he represents the future of this profession. And I think without any further ado, I just want to uh, say, Joe, let's hear what you have to say. Thank you, Dr. Barwell. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, as Richard was just saying, um, it was we actually met in 2006 when I was kind of urged to um, come listen to him speak. And it was a very intimate setting um, back in 2006. I kind of hesitantly went, but uh, you know, due to the intimate setting and um, and his message, I had my epiphany as to, wow, we're really on the cusp of something great here. Um, but let me digress a minute. You know, we all started chiropractic. Um, probably we all have different journeys, but ultimately, I think it was because it's a great profession, having the ability to really make an impact on people's lives and really start to get sick people well. So. After I graduated school, I was kind of working on this whole, um, initially I came out, you know, I was still kind of stuck in this subluxation bone on nerve model. And uh, that always presented challenges for me. Um, but I still told the story and I, and I was very successful at what I did. But, you know, as with many people out there, I'm sure you know, you know, practice is not easy. Building a practice can be extremely stressful. And through this journey, especially after my epiphany with Richard, um, it's been a totally different experience. So, you know, we all agree that that chiropractic has far greater reaching reaching than just bone on nerve and popping bones, et cetera, like the public views us. And I think the reason we have such great challenges in our profession is we've done a really terrible job explaining what it is that we do. So, I always knew that chiropractic has such a great reach, but I struggled with people truly, truly, truly getting it. So when I opened up my practice after I graduated at uh, chiropractic school, you know, what I did notice was I did screenings almost every weekend. Um, and I did that for almost my first three years. You know, you know, you get out what you put in, right? Energy out equals energy back. Just get out there, tell the story, tell the word, um, get people in, get sick people well. And I did that. But what I did notice that when I say patient didn't really get it. I had a pretty powerful doctor's report, um, and people were willing to commit to care. But one of the challenges I found was the lack of referrals I was receiving. And I didn't understand why Mr. Jones was willing to come in, commit to his care process. Um, and he, what I thought, obviously understood the value of what we were doing and what I was telling him. But he, you know, when I came in, it was a month later, and I said, hey, Mr. Jones, you know, where are your kids? Where's your wife? And what was the responses I got were things like, oh, yeah, well, they don't really have problems. They don't really have back pain. And I thought, you know, I don't understand. In my mind, my inner dialogue would say, I don't really understand this because you're willing to commit to care, yet you're not really, you don't see the urgency of getting your family in here as well. Um, you know, the 90% of the people that come into the office, you know, their their initial response to us is, you know, they usually suffer from back pain, neck pain, headaches, sciatic, et etc. And that's how the that's how the public views us. Um, and we as chiropractors know there's much greater impact than the back pain, etc. But there was a disconnect in the message I was I was telling them and what they were actually hearing. You know, it's a, you know. What you say and what people hear aren't often the same things. So I found that challenging. And also, every so often, you know, people just started to fall out of care. And you know, why do they usually fall out of care? Because in their minds, they were getting well. And it's not that they were getting well. They were just getting symptomatic pain relief. So I did this for roughly you know, better part of, of 11 years with this model, you know, but talking about 
subluxation, you know, I, I was a subluxation-based practice. As a matter of fact, after my third year of practice, I no longer even took x-rays. Um, I used other technology, which at the time was good, but for me it presented a lot of challenges as well. So really connecting the nervous system to their back pain was a challenge in the sense of not my ability to communicate it, I, I, I say that, but not my ability to communicate it, for them to really understand what I was really communicating because I felt there was really no bridge between their nervous system function and the rest of their health concerns. It made sense when I explained it verbally, but to them it wasn't really tangible because they really couldn't see a difference or, or the connections. They couldn't actually physically see the connections. Yes, and I had some people who would say, you know, I, I, you know my asthma is better, my digestive system is better, et cetera, you know, all these great, seemingly great things, but at the end of the day, I was still, unbeknownst to me, still stuck in much more of a, of a symptomatic practice than I had really realized. Um, and the other problem, as you can see on the bottom of this, that the last bullet point was, I also had a challenge with, with why was Mr. Jones responding, who came in for, I don't know, just say something like that, I got responding to care really well, but uh, Mrs. Smith wasn't, yet their symptoms were the same, their, you know, subluxation pattern of sorts was the same, but I, I you know, we all struggle with the people who respond differently to our care. So, you know, these were all the challenges I had in practice, not unlike, you know, everybody has in practice. So when we, when we say the words like, you know, I had my epiphany in 2006 when I was speaking to Richard, well, when Richard was actually doing this presentation, he was speaking about the connection of the nervous system and the studies that he did. I don't know how many people are familiar with his um, 4K study in which he actually mapped out people's brains, brainscaping, and then he adjusted them. Um, some of them were light contact, some of them were um, instruments, some of them were by hand, and what he noticed was in this study, in one research paper of the year in Sherman College in 2005, was that uh, the impact of the adjustment actually changed brainwave patterns. Um, and that was pretty profound for me, and that's where my epiphany began that night. And as he went on with his presentation, and it was almost three hours that night because we had an instrument setting, so we went down the rabbit hole a little bit, you know, realizing that when I said earlier we're on the cusp of, of something great and revolutionary, revolutionary, that's how I felt. I felt that, you know, ultimately using this instrumentation, it could revolutionize healthcare. And, and in my, this is my personal opinion. It could revolutionize healthcare and most importantly thrust chiropractic into the forefront of this because from what I was looking at, it bridged the gap into what we were talking about from a chiropractic standpoint and what the population was experiencing with their ill health. So that was my epiphany. So when we talk about, you know, what is the disease process, now, you know, how I describe the disease process and, and my, my, how I describe the explanation of the disease process in the office is this, is ultimately the public out there doesn't really understand the paradigm in which they're operating in. You know, we talk about uh, health care reform, you know, Obamacare, all of these crazy things. But at the end of the day, you know, people, it, the public still believes that taking a statin is preventative wellness care. They actually truly believe that. And that's why when we talk about wellness as a profession, that's, that's where the disconnect begins, where because we're talking about wellness, and they hear about wellness, but they have a total misunderstanding of the difference between wellness and disease. So when we talk about disease, every disease ultimately is a problem of too much or too little of something, right? In this case, um, when we talk about things like an ulcer, too much stomach acid or not enough mucus, right, is going to ultimately cause a problem in the intestinal lining or the, the stomach lining and you're going to get an ulcer. So it's always a problem of too much or too little. So it, then why is there too much or too little ultimately, right? And what we did, and science says this across the board, I have an old, a whole email account dedicated just to medical um, websites and journals, et cetera, that I get emailed uh, research studies, articles, et cetera, and, and through vast things, through, through a wide variety of avenues, and they're all saying the same thing, that stress is the major killer. Now, we use stress very loosely in chiropractic, you know, and that's another thing, too, not to ramble on too much about this, but when we even talk about stress, 
people, the population doesn't really truly understand what stress is. And stress is a body response. It's not the event. So when we talk about stress, I really, I, I really make this a point in the office that not all stress is bad. Stress is unavoidable, right? And stress is necessary. Going to bed is a stress. Waking up is a stress. Anytime your body has to do something other than it's doing right now, that's a stress. So if 80% of all diseases is stress-related, what does that mean? That just means that everything in your body is not doing what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. And that means your body's working too hard. It's out of sync. It, it lacks coordination. Therefore, the disease process starts. Okay, And if the disease process really takes root and you start getting outwardly symptomatic from that imbalance, now you're labeled with a disease. So then people think, all right, well, to counteract that, I will take a medication, and that is wellness because I'm stopping the symptoms. So once we explain that the disease process in and of itself is just a lack of coordination within the body, and ultimately what is coordinating all these functions, as chiropractors we know, obviously, that's the nervous system. It's more specifically the brain, right? So when we start to sh shift the paradigm of, of individuals in the office, as mine was shifted, as, although I understood that fundamentally, as I start to see the bridge, the ability to measure this stuff, that was pretty profound to me. So then when we talk about health, well, health is basically the ability to respond in an appropriate, proportionate manner to your world. That's all health is. That means your body is in balance. And what is the ultimate organizer of that balance is the nervous system. So how I describe chiropractic in, in, in the office, and especially to the patients, is we're just going to use your spine, sometimes your extremities, some other, sometimes other things, as portals of entry into your nervous system. Because it's really not about the bones. The bones are just another symptom. Just you know, the, the misalignments in your spine um, are just another symptom, just as high cholesterol, high blood pressure, ulcers, cancer. These are all symptoms of the lack of full life expression. So we start this paradigm shift, and this is really important in the office, and it was very important for me to really help communicate what it is that we do. So then again, I don't have to, there, there, isn't, a, a, there isn't a disconnect within myself and the patient base, and they start to understand what we're actually doing and what chiropractic is affording them. So it's one thing to talk about the nervous system, but unless you're measuring how that nervous system is functioning, what are you really doing? Because if you're just using, as an example, maybe just x-rays or just leg length, et cetera, you may be saying, well, you know what, we did change this, but at what expense? You know, you, you, we did restore your cervical curve, but did we also in the process increase your heart rate? And I have a story about that later on um, to inappropriate levels. So we've got to have a broad range of what we're actually measuring because we as chiropractors love to say it's, it's about the nervous system and it's about getting well and, you know, it, it, it's about wellness, it's about body function, but we do nothing to truly measure broad spectrum the body function. So then we talk about stress and the stress responses. When we have initial um, stress response, right, as if a bear was chasing you or a lion was chasing you through the woods, you start to have physiological changes within that body, right? And an appropriate response to me being chased by a, a lion through the Sahara would be I'm going to have an increased adrenaline. Right, which is going to increase my heart rate, which is going to make my hands cold, which is going to make my hands clammy, my pupils dilate. Um, I'm going to have an increase in cholesterol levels. I'm going to have a decrease in the sensation of pain. Um, all of these things start to happen simultaneously. That's a stress response. And at the same time, I'm going to have a decrease in digestion. I'm going to have a decrease in reproduction. Um, I'm going to have a decrease in growth and healing. Right? All of these things are happening simultaneously. After, and once I get away from that lion and I, I'm safe, my body has to have a recovery period where my parasympathetic comes in and it turns that off. You don't need all that adrenaline. You don't need your heart rate to be that high. You don't need your hands to be cold and clammy. Your digestive system should turn back on. Your reproductive system should turn back on. Right? That is an appropriate stress response and recovery period. So you can see how all of a sudden, if that isn't happening appropriately, maybe you don't recover from stress and you still have all that adrenaline, you still have all that cholesterol, and that happens chronically, well, that's going to start to wear out body function, right? If my heart rate just keeps escalating and escalating and escalating and I still have massive amounts of adrenaline, that's a problem and it's going to cause a systemic problem. 
And then ultimately, as chiropractors, once we go in there and, and we put an impulse or information back into that nervous system to restore balance and organization within that system, the rest of the body starts to follow in its coordinated response and its proportionate response to the stress level. What do I mean by proportionate? Well, if I am, you know, I don't know, walking down the street having a conversation and somebody laughs and punches me in the shoulder, I'll have a different response as if I'm literally being chased across the Sahara by a lion, right? Well, everything's got to be proportionate, right? The same thing as if you were, you know, somebody laughingly punched you in the arm as somebody stabs you in the arm, right? You're going to have a proportionate response to the amount of stimulus that your body is um, receiving. So we want to make sure that's, that's just a, a proportionate response. Your body has the ability to recover. So this started to make more sense in the aspect of what chiropractic was actually really doing in restoring balance, et cetera. So we just kind of spoke about this, the consequences of an inappropriate stress response. We have things like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, irritable bowel syndrome, poor attention. We may have like constipation, low pain threshold, et cetera. I don't have to read all of these. Migraine, headaches, seizures, et cetera, anxiety. So as you start to see, when we talk about the problem of too much or too little within the system, you can, as you start to look at this list that's on your screen right now, you start to say, wow, I have a lot of patients that are suffering from a lot of these, these conditions. You know, I have migraines, right? We suffer from, there's a lot of uh, patients that are coming into your office complaining of migraines. Well, why are they having the migraine, right? And majority of migraines are caused by um, vascular insufficiency or vascular inequality, whether it be side to side, et cetera, um, or global. And then when you go in there, you restore balance to not only muscle tone and structure tone, but vascular tone as well right, and neurological tone. So all of a sudden, once you balance that sympathetic and, and parasympathetic, sympathetic and parasympathetic response, these are all symptoms of an imbalance between those two and how your body's governing itself. So this was all coming glaringly clear to me while Richard was speaking. Um, so then we, it brings us right into the neuroinfinity and, and, you know, what was the importance and the, the epiphany of this? So as we start to talk about the stress response and the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic activity and how basically all of the symptoms and diseases that we're suffering from in, in this country um, are a result of an imbalance between these two sides of the nervous system, well, then why aren't we really talking about that? Because why are we talking about x-rays and spinal curves, et cetera, albeit important, Proper spinal hygiene is important, but we all have those patients who are sick but have good spinal hygiene. So we start to say, well, what is the recommendation of care in that person? You know they're sick, yet they have good spinal hygiene. So where's the link, and how is this person going to understand that the nervous system is a wreck, therefore their body has an inability to express itself in an appropriate manner if they still have good spinal hygiene? Right? What if they're young? What if they're 18, 19 years old, and they've been suffering from, um, you know, irritable bowel syndrome for 10 years, and they have, uh, you know, they're also on multiple medications for um, ADD or ADHD or something along those lines. We know that their nervous system is working far from optimum, right? But as we look at them, they don't really have much degeneration, and for their age, they have pretty good curvatures, et cetera. So there was a problem there. There was a disconnect. And I could, everybody who signed up from that point was based solely on my ability to make sense of it, but it really, at the end of the day, wasn't tangible for them because I had to take my word for it. So when we come into the neuroinfinity, the neuroinfinity I, I found was pretty profound because it actually started to measure several components simultaneously um, as a response to the environment. So when somebody has a stimulus, we watch their body respond. And then when we take that stimulus away, we watch their body recover, right? And it measures things like brainwave activity. So we see how they're actually processing the world, how they're actually processing a stimulus, how they're, do they have the ability to relax and slow their brain down, inability to engage that parasympathetic system, which again was pretty profound, right? We talk about the brain and the nervous system. Now we're truly, truly measuring it in a sense of an EEG in the office, a very simply performed EMG, I mean EEG. We also couple that with things like hand temperature. Right? Hands get cold when that stress response comes in, and they warm up when you relax. So we're actually measuring that response. The skin conductance, which is the hand sweatiness. We can actually watch, do those hands get clammy? Does the, does the perspiration response in their hands increase with the stimulus, and does it 
drop and, and dry off and normalize when they start to recover. Then we do things like respiration rate. We do things like heart rate, something called heart rate variability, which is a great indicator of future health potential because um, it is a direct res evaluation of the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. So it's a, it's a great indicator of where they are now and where their future potential lies um, because we want to see the organization of that system. And the last thing is we also do um, static EMG. But I'm sorry, surface EMG, but we do it dynamically is what I'm trying to say. I didn't say that well, but we do a dynamic surface EMG so we can actually see their muscles react during a stimulation time and actually see do their muscles have the ability to relax. So we're looking at seven components and we're doing it simultaneously under a stimulation and a rest. So we will look at three things when, when somebody comes in. We look at is everything in their body doing what it's supposed to do, when it's supposed to do it, is their reaction to a stimulus proportionate to the stimulus, like I was saying before, right? We don't want somebody's heart rate, if they were arbitrary numbers, if somebody's heart rate was sitting here at 70, we don't, the, the, there's nothing life-threatening in this test, so as we start to stimulate them, we don't want to see their heart rate go to 140, 150, which I've seen. That is an extremely improportionate response. If you're being chased by a lion physically, literally, then yeah, your heart rate may go pretty damn high. But under these circumstances, what we're doing in the office, it should by no means. We want to see it go up to, you know, from 70 to 78, maybe 80 at its most. But if we see somebody going up to, uh, you know, 50 beats higher than our baseline, we know we have a problem. We have a, a disproportionate response, et cetera. And then the last thing we look at is, does the body have the ability to come back down to a resting level? So when we remove that stimulus, does the body come down to a resting level? Does their parasympathetic take over and allow that body to heal, grow, repair, and rest? So it's a great indicator. So as Richard was speaking and he was talking about all this, I said, wow, if we can measure this, this is pretty profound. Um, you know, and uh, truth be told, when I was first introduced to the NeuroInfinity, I was like, yeah, this is kind of cool because it was just shown to me. I just saw it. Um, and that was back in 2005, the end of 2005, I, I saw the neuroinfinity. I said, wow, that's some pretty cool stuff, but I don't really see the chiropractic explanation. Then when, when Richard came in um, and he started talking about, you know, what it is that we're actually doing, you know, we're actually affecting the nervous system. He shows this paper where chiropractic adjustment, whether it be light contact instrument or um, by hand was actually altering brainwave function, improving, improving brainwave function, improving the body's ability to heal. I said, this is profound. And if we could measure that and show somebody, it's no longer a leap of faith for that patient to say, listen, you know, um, I, it, what you're saying makes sense, and I'll just do what you say because it seems to make sense. Now it's more of a situation where you don't have to believe me. I'm showing you how well or poorly your body is truly functioning. So that whole aspect was pretty profound, even more so since we introduced it to the office. So as we start to practice the neuroinfinity and people start to really get it, people start to say, that is me. That is who I am. Um, when we do our doctor's report, et cetera, and the most interesting thing I I'm finding is when I'm done with the doctor's report, um, and I say, do you have any questions? It's very rarely about them. In other words, you know, my previous doctor's report, you know, at the end, they would, you know, anybody have any questions? Or I'd raise their hand. They'd say things like, so you're telling me that if I go through this process, there's a good chance that not only my back pain will go away, but, you know, it may improve my blood pressure. It may improve this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, yeah, that is the old overall premise. But here, when we're done and we're explaining it and we're showing people how their body is actually responding to their environment, people get it. And they say, wow, that is me. I am pretty screwed up. And I do not ask for referrals, but... I, for the first time, you know, when I said before about Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones is now telling me that his children need to be under care. Mr. Jones is telling me that his wife needs to be under care. Mrs. Smith is telling me that her, you know, uncle, the neighbor, the school teacher, the friend down the block, they need to be under care because now it's making more sense. And people often say, this isn't just a chiropractic office. This is something far greater than I've ever experienced. And this is... And it's almost like, you know, in a way, I don't know if it was, uh, I, I, that meeting with Dr. Barwell that day was serendipitous in so many ways because it was almost prophetic that now my epiphany is actually coming 
true and has manifested itself in the office without me doing any advertising, without me doing any health screenings. I haven't done a health screening in, I don't even know, six years, five years, but <laughs> and it are, it, it's basically all referrals just by telling the story and understanding how the body works. And then more importantly, more, most importantly, is measuring it. And then we have a roadmap to really see how people are responding to care and where they are on the spectrum. So it helps us you know, with those non-responders, like we were saying before, like why is Mrs. Smith not responding, but Mr. Jones is? You have to have relatively the same complaint. Well, now we understand that their nervous systems may not be identical. Their symptomatic state may be very similar, but their their um, nervous systems are not even close to working the same way. So people really start to get it. So we can personalize our care plans. Um, the practice is much easier. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not out every weekend. I can spend time with my family rather than sitting out in a, in a booth talking to people about chiropractic, which is a great thing, but we all know that that can be an exhausting endeavor. Where here, people are telling me, and we've built a very big practice in a very short period of time by doing nothing but telling the story. And people are very, very um, caught up in their own care, which is great. I don't have to hound people. So it's, you know, the, the symptomatic, they see the bigger picture. We don't really, if they come in with sciatica, we don't really talk about their sciatica. We talk about the overall effect of the nervous system and how efficient or inefficient it is. So it has made practice much more enjoyable and much easier when patients are active participants, which was awesome. So when we talk about things with the Neuroinfinity and, and how we communicate all of this information, we have things like the biochart, which is just... Um, about a, an overall symptomatic state of just talking about uh, when the sympathetic and parasympathetic are out of balance, what are the general symptoms that start to manifest themselves, and now you believe that your heart disease, your blood pressure, your cholesterol levels, your digestive disorders, your back pain, your cancers, you start to understand that these are not separate conditions. They're all expressions of how disjointed your nervous system is. Um, we also have the law of hormesis, which is basically, for those of you who haven't really heard of the law of hormesis, is basically um, a, a hard, strong impulse, if you will, will, will stop an aberrant pattern where um, more of a light, soft, gentle introduction to break that pattern actually starts to reverse it. And that's why soft tissue, um, I'm sorry, uh, light techniques, et cetera, like uh, network, et cetera, does work because you're doing light force into that system. And the system starts to really absorb and take in that. You're not fighting. You're not, the body's not fighting the impulse or the change. It starts to really adapt to it very quickly. Um, it also, the, when we start doing the neuroinfinity results, we get the stress response evaluation results back, it really helps us establish the frequency for care, the duration for care, and the intensity of the care plans. Because listen, at the end of the day, how Mr. Jones receives an adjustment, I mean, Ms. yeah, Mr. Jones receives an adjustment is going to be drastically different than how Mrs. Smith receives an adjustment, right, based on the baseline of their nervous system. If one nervous system is really sympathetically driven, so we know that their, their nervous system is very excited, and a chiropractic adjustment goes in there, and it may cause more stimulation to an excited system, well, depending on how excited it is, it may be too much for that system to handle. Whereas somebody else may come in and their system is really, really flatlined, and we can go in there and we can really turn up the volume with an adjustment, with the intensity and the duration and the frequency to really mold that system into much more of an active system. So it depends on where that system is and how it's going to receive an adjustment. But it's better to know that going in. And I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute. Um, and there's a lot of research supporting neurologically based chiropractic. Um, so as we talk about, you know, when I, I said I was going to give a couple of examples, this is a friend, um, Matt. And he unfortunately died a couple of years ago of colon cancer. And the funny thing about Matt, not funny haha, -ha, but funny hmm, is just that, you know, when they went through these, they knew he had cancer, so they went through all these CT scans, et cetera, 
and this is our current methodology of, of dealing with all of this in the public's eyes. You know, he lived far away. He lived up north, and we're down here in Georgia. And you know, at the end of the day, they give a CT scan, and they realize he has cancer. So they open him up, and they realize he's stage four. But prior to that, they were saying, we're just going to go ahead and give chemo. And as they start to give chemo, you know, they don't really realize what they're dealing with at this point. So they open him up, they realize he's stage four, and then they want to see, well, we'll do another CT scan to see if he's responding to the chemotherapy, yet they didn't see the condition of stage four when they did the first CT. So at the end of the day, the way we're handling our healthcare system out there, and I know I'm preaching to the choir right now, but you know, this disease model is just not working, and poisoning people, poisoning people, poisoning people is not the answer. So the reason I tell this story is because ultimately it's our job chiropractically to improve the healing ability of that body. So who knows what would have happened had Matt had the opportunity to really undergo something like a stress response and to see how coordinated or uncoordinated his system was. And unfortunately, we didn't have that opportunity. So. And I'm sure there's several people you know out there, either in your practice or in your personal lives, that you say there could have been so much more done for this individual. And it saddens me that he had to suffer the way he did, um, even under the chemotherapy, which was just horrible for him. So I want to give another example of, of Linda. Here's an individual who we had in her office. She came into our office, and she was, um, she'd been under corrective care for two years. And she sought me out. Uh, through a series of connections with different people. And she came in just because um, she had a problem. And her problem was, for the last two years, she would often black out after an adjustment. Um, oftentimes, she, if she wasn't blacking out, her heart would be racing, her heart would be racing, and she'd have to go sit there and just you know, try to settle down her heart, which is pounding out of her chest. So it, it was very challenging because when she's telling me this, I'm like, all right, well, you know, more isn't better. Just jumping up and down on this person, and they've done it for the last two years where they're just saying this is the more of a healing process. We've just got to work through it. Well, when is the point where you stop working through it? So with her, after we did a stress response, we found out a couple of profound things. One of those things was her, her baseline heart rate for a 27-year-old, mind you, was 105. That was her resting heart rate. When we stimulated her, went up to 130s. So here is this person, a 27-year-old female, who is in the red. Her heart rate, her resting heart rate was 105. Now her skin conductance, which is the hand sweatiness, was 27. Now 1.5 is the high side of normal in anybody's skin conductance. She was at 27. And hand temperature should be somewhere in the vicinity of 94 to 97. Hers was 74. So her system was in such overdrive, every time she got adjusted, her system would just, boom, blow up. And to the point where she would black out. And this went on for a better part of two years. So what it really opened my eyes to was, all right, here's somebody that you've got to handle differently. Although they look seemingly, and this person had no back pain or neck pain, they seemingly look like a very healthy individual on the outside. Um, they really were. She was a very fit individual, but nervous system, she was a train wreck. So this gave us the opportunity to handle things differently. And the only difference between being seen here and being at the other office that she was seen at wasn't adjustment skill at all. What it was was just the ability to see what's truly happening globally with her, which they, they were unable to see that full picture. So once you were able to see that full picture, that changes the whole ballgame. Now, with her, what we did was we just adjusted a little less and a lot lighter, and we did that for about a, almost a two-month period before we can actually kind of get a little more, um, do a little more hand adjusting, et cetera, and she responded beautifully. We got a heart rate down to 73, her resting heart rate. Um, you know, her hand skin conductance, when came, she was still a little on the high side, she was still around two, but from 27 to two is, is pretty profound, but hadn't we done the stress response, we never really truly would have got a better picture of what her true issue was. 
and how we can optimize our treatment for that individual. So that was a pretty profound example of what was taking place in the office at the time. My last story is about Gary. Here's uh, this individual was referred to me, and you know this was an interesting story. Real quick was that here's a guy who at the end of a very busy um, evening shift he had to wait a, a pretty long time. I think he waited a little over an hour because we were so busy. And when I finally came in, it was the, it was the very end of the shift. A very nice man. When I came in, to introduce myself, he was waiting in the office. I said, uh, hey, how are you? My name is Joe Demian. Nice to meet you. And he said, hi, I'm Gary. And I got to tell you, I don't know why I'm here. And I said, I don't know why you're here either. Let's start at the beginning. So 63-year-old, um, wonderful, fit man who was suffering from severe anxiety. And he's sitting in my office. And now, mind you, I was number 45 on a list of specialists. So when he said, I've already seen 44 specialists in the course of 10 months. I've spent $150,000 out of pocket. Nobody knows what's wrong with me. Okay? And it started out, his symptoms started out as insatiable hunger, segued into severe debilitating anxiety. And this was not an obese man. This was a very fit individual, very successful, well-to-do guy. So he comes in. We do his stress response. And this guy is a mess. So we start to really realize how his brain is truly functioning. And he doesn't have an organic lesion, which means the guy didn't have a tumor. It's just brain and his nervous system was so out of sync. So as we start to explain this to him, he says, wow, I don't, you know, I don't understand. He was a little mad as we got through care. He said, you know, not at me. He said, I don't understand why it took you 30 seconds to see something that 44 specialists couldn't see, including the lead neurologist at Emory. And my point was, they're not stupid individuals. The lead neurologist of Emory is a brilliant man. The problem is they're just looking for organic issues, meaning they're just looking for brain tumors or, or a lesion of some sort. And we're just looking at the coordination between systems. So within an eight-month, very intense program, we got this guy about 95 to 96% better. And this guy was so thankful. If somebody comes to me and he says things like, I'm so blessed to have the experience of being in this office. You know, you've literally saved my life. And now I understand what chiropractic is. Because it would have been very difficult and challenging to say to that man, well, the reason that you're having all of these issues, the insatiable hunger and the anxiety, is because you've lost your cervical curve. That doesn't even really make sense, right? So I'd like to think chiropractic brings a lot more to the table than just restoring proper um, spinal hygiene and biomechanics. Much greater than that is just altering that nervous system in a sense that it has the ability to start to coordinate all these body functions. And you know, here's a man who's sitting here all the time, no matter what the state is, and his heart rate's racing, his pupils are dilated, and his adrenaline and cholesterol levels are through the roof because his sympathetics are not turning off. So as we start to guide this person through a corrective plan catered to him, he starts to respond very, 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 very well. And all of a sudden he says, now I understand why I was referred into this office. You know, and don't forget, on the first meeting, he said, I don't know why the hell I'm sitting in a chiropractic office. You know, and, and I understood where he was coming from, but once I explained and showed him what was going on, he was like, all right, well, that makes more sense than anybody's told me so far. So it's a pretty profound response that starts to take place within the office. It morphs into something far greater. One more story about that is, you know, I'm sitting here. We have a sort of, sort of an open adjusting um, T-bar area. And uh, in the waiting room, which I really can't visually see, but I can hear, um, there's, people, there's people sitting there talking amongst themselves unsolicited about the nervous system. And they're sitting there having conversations about uh, the biochart and where they are and, and you know, how chiropractic is changing their lives. And this is unsolicited. So when I say I don't ask for referrals, I don't. But people are, are, are having unsolicited conversations about the nervous system and then in turn referring everyone they know in. And we're seeing a lot of people in a short relative time frame um, by just telling the story, but more importantly, making all of this information tangible for the patient to understand what chiropractic's goals and objectives are. So when people, when I explain this to people, that's why, I, like I said earlier, people start to say, wow, you know, this isn't just a chiropractic office. You know, 
And I get what they mean. It's not like we're doing anything different, you know, like, you know, we have a medical model here or something, but they're just saying that that's the greatest explanation of chiropractic, and now I understand why I need to be in this office. Because after I've done the stress response evaluation, you've just nailed me. You know, I have a lot of people saying, that is me. That is my problem. This makes sense. I've had people cry, say, why hasn't anybody ever told me this before? You know, and it's just the explanation that all, all of our problems from a healthcare perspective are a problem of too much or too little. And that too little in, includes too little healing taking place in the body. So now you're bridging the gap between your message of nervous system function and its ability to coordinate all of your body functions. And then in turn, what chiropractic's goal and objective is, is to use the spine, use the extremities, as just basically portals of entry into that system to invoke that change, to facilitate that balance. That is our goal. That is our objective, far greater than just spinal biomechanics. So as you start to improve their body function, by default, one of those body functions you're improving is spinal biomechanics. So all of a sudden, you're making people like Gary here consider chiropractic as an option. And he'll probably be spreading the word. He, he actually moved several states away. Um, but now he's going to spread the word just talking about how chiropractic changed his life for something other than back pain or neck pain. Okay, And he still carries around his SREs, which is pretty comically checks in with us every so often. Um, so the two stories of my chiropractic career um, prior to the, the neuroinfinity, um, you know, patients were willing to commit to care themselves, but I, I questioned in my own mind whether they were really, really getting it because they really weren't referring. Um, you know, a couple of them did, but they really weren't spreading the word with any sort of enthusiasm. And, we, and so it took me a, a lot of hard work to build that practice. Um, the patient's focus was ultimately really at the end of the day, if you cleared the fog, it was still about their pain model, um, regardless of what I said, because they had to just take my word for it. Um, and the results we got were very good, but I still had challenges, as we all do, with non-responders. Why isn't Mrs. Smith responding to care? And I, you know, uh, I'm challenged to understand that concept with this individual, because on the surface, it seems like a fairly simple scenario. Like the Linda story, right? You would think prior to doing the SRE that, oh, you know, here's an asymptomatic person for the most part, so we just need to keep her on a wellness plan. Meanwhile, every time she got adjusted, she went off the charts. So when I have the neuroinfinity, since implementing it, the patients really truly get it and understand it. They become very active in their care plans. And more importantly, they're, they're really insisting that their family be in. Um, like I said earlier, you know, they're, they're, they're telling me that their children need to be in here. So when I say at the end of a doctor's report, any questions, people are saying, yeah, I have a neighbor who has, boom, my kids, I need to get, literally, my kids need to be in here, um, which is pretty awesome, you know, when people start to really participate in their care and see the bigger picture, that changes, that's a game changer in anybody's practice, okay, just the enjoyment factor of it, right? And the patient's focus is really about health. Even if they're coming in here about neck pain, back pain, sciatica, they see the bigger picture of what the imbalance in the nervous system ultimately leads to so they can start to see down the road and where they're headed based on how they're functioning. So now all of a sudden they're active participants and they're no longer coming in telling me about their pain symptoms. They're telling me about the bigger picture. Okay, they don't want to be that person who has the autoimmune disease. They don't want to be that person who's starting to develop illnesses like cancers or irritable bowel if they don't have it already, right? Um, and then also, as we do this, we can start to personalize the care because, listen, at the end of the day, not everybody needs the same amount of care. So as you start to look at how well or poorly their body's functioning, you can really cater a care plan specifically to, to their needs. So it's just not a rubber stamp or you need to be here X amount of times for X amount of weeks, et cetera. You know, you cater somebody's care plan based on how their bodies actually truly function. So my patients refer like crazy. They don't do it because they like me. They do it because they love their family and friends. You know, at the end of the day, I always, I've been saying this for years, everybody wants to be well, not everybody wants to get well. So if people understand why they're not well, all of a sudden, it makes it easier to start to get well. And 
they want to spread the word and tell their family that there are other options than the ones that they're doing that are not working. And that is why I became a chiropractor, and that is the story of my epiphany after meeting with Richard Barwell. I know I kind of raced through a lot of these points, but I did want to leave some time for questions because um, oftentimes we run too long with the amount of questions. So I just wanted to throw it out there, and I'll throw it um, to see if anybody has any questions, um, if they'd like me to expound on anything else or anything. Okay, this is Dee Dee, and jo uh, Dr. Joe, great job, um, you know, and thank you so much for taking time out of your practice to, uh, to help us present this great information. Um, for the attendees out there, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Dr. Joe or any of our other clients that are standing by um, to answer questions about using the Neuroinfinity in practice, um, you know, daily, um, please raise your hand and I can unmute you, and if you do not have a mic and speakers, if you would please just type your question into the control panel. All right, our first question is from Dr. Worley. Hey, uh, afternoon. A great presentation. I really like what I'm hearing. I, I'm concerned. This is just reading the output of the nervous system, its ability to integrate. It's not actually imparting a, an impulse into the body. Is that correct? We're still adjusting by hand? Correct. You're adjusting. You're doing what you do, whatever that is, whether you're network, whether you're full spine, whether you're drop. SOT. It doesn't really matter. SOT it has no it has no bearing on how you practice. It doesn't even tell you where the my hands are in quotes right now where the subluxation is. You know, all your, it's 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 measuring what's coming out, what's going on within the body. It's not a therapy. Um, so yeah. it it's diagnostic, but there is another component of the neuroinfinity, which is the bio and neural feedback, which is a conversation for another day. But no, to answer your question, it's only measuring how the body's functioning, and it's a great roadmap. So as you go through the course of your care, you know, maybe you are a, uh, a full spine doctor, et cetera, and you'll actually get a better understanding of how somebody's actually truly responding to your care. So then maybe you'll, you need to do some SOT if they're not responding, or maybe your SOT, and you need to just kind of increase some of the stimulation factors. Is that so how does, that is partly, yes. How does it work then? Is it like a mild vision where you scan the spine, and, and that is going to tell us where there's you know, more stress on the spine? No, because it's it's not segmentally, um, it's not a segmental situation where um, I use something very similar to that previously. Um, this is actually measuring. You're doing an EEG. You're doing hand temperatures. So you're doing this globally. And the difference between the other ones is um, the myovision, you know, the insight. All of these things is they're static, right? In other words, they're they're. They're a moment in time, but it's not really telling you how this person is responding or not responding, right, to their world and to their stimulus, how they're interacting. Where this, we're, we're introducing stimulus and neurological stimulus, and there's several time, several ways, but it's all how the brain starts to process that stimulus, and then in turn, what is your body's direct reaction to it. Okay, very cool. So where can I see this in action? I, I'd like to actually visit an office that's actually doing one. Um, that's a better question for Didi. Where, where are you located, Dr. Worley? I'm in Naperville, Illinois, just outside okay. Chicago. Naperville, Illinois. All right, I will give that a look, and I will have your I have your email address. I'll send you that information. Thank you all very much. Okay. Very welcome. Uh, any more questions? There's a few being typed in here, so give just one second. Dr. Merrick. Yes. Hello. Your hand was raised. I'm assuming you want to make a comment. I I, I did. You know I. I wanted to say that, you know, for people out there using myovision or the subluxation station, when I first got the NeuroInfinity, um, I really just wanted to use it like the myovision, like the, the uh, actually like the subluxation station I had, and I did. And you can use uh, the NeuroInfinity to do paraspinal uh, EMG and paraspinal um, uh, thermo uh, thermography. And in fact, it's actually kind of cool that you can do them both at the same time, which is a, it's a neat feature. But it didn't take long to, to figure out that this other uh, protocol, this stress response evaluation, had so much more uh, information about the, about the nervous system's ability to adapt to the world, which is really what, what health is all about, so that I stopped using it in that old version of the uh, paraspinal thermography and paraspinal uh, EMG and started using the stress response evaluation for what it had to offer. Okay. All right, there's some more questions coming in. Um, 
what is the cost of the system? And oh, by the way, what technique does Dr. Joe use? So Joe, if you'll address the first, then I'll come back and address the second. Um, as far as technique goes, I use like a uh, homogenization of um, SOP, AK, global assessment, and also some functional neurology. It's just what I use. Um, it's just kind of a homogenization of the, you know, we all kind of find some techniques that we like. Um, and I also do some activator on some people, um, you know, depending on what their nervous system requires and what their nervous system can handle. But my primary, to answer the question, my primary is homogenization of SOTAK, global assessment, and functional neurology. All right. And the second answer to that question, Dr. Henderson, is the um, the, the cost of the machine is 15995 but it comes with everything you need in order to, um, you know, set it up, make it work, uh, training, interpretation help, um, marketing, posters for your wall. I mean, it, it's, it's a complete package, and I think uh, Dr. Joe or any of the others on the line can, can attest to that. Um, yeah, the, the support is great, and the, the group is, is great. We just recently had a training here in Atlanta um, a couple of weeks ago, and it was just phenomenal. It was just phenomenal. Uh, actually, Dr. Heisel would like to comment on that. Uh, Dr. Marissa? Dr. Marissa, are you unmuted? Uh, now I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, that's better. How are you, Dr. Joe? Good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So, um, like Dr. Joe, I um, opened a practice using the NeuroInfinity after a real hiatus from chiropractic. I left about six years ago because the profession was not, for me, doing what I had wanted or what I had hoped that it might be. Um, and I retrained as a, as a midwife and I retrained as a, as a Pilates instructor and it was really it was really neurologically based chiropractic that made me want to, to do this again, to be back in this profession. And we've just opened a new practice um, using the NeuroInfinity. And one thing that I'm seeing right from the outset is the level of understanding that patients seem to have. So when we do a scan and we sit down to do a report of findings and we say to people, does, does this make sense? Does this resonate with you? What we've been hearing over and over again is, yeah, that's not a surprise to me. Um, so it's something that people really intuitively understand. I mean, yes, the brainwave activity and limbic system function, those aren't, that's not vocabulary that they might have had, but they've had a sense of their own health and where they are um, that no one has really been able to explain to them to this point. So when we start talking about underarousal or overarousal or the way that their bodies are dealing with, with stressors and with cortisol release, that's something that is really resonating with the people that we're seeing um, since we opened a practice actually just a month ago. So that's something that's really exciting already um, and something that we're able to base recommendations around. Um, and we're just starting to get into doing some of the neuro and biofeedback in the office and, and we're having really um, great responses and people who are really excited to start getting into that as well. So that's been our experience. Great. Thank, thank you, Dr. Marissa. And I think the bridge right there uh, to expound on what Marissa was saying was just that as well as, as all of that, the understanding, they're also seeing the implications of chiropractic. Know, and how chiropractic, once you facilitate that change and balance, mean that, that how that system is working, they start to see their global health. It's not a matter of, oh, I feel better. You're actually showing them they are better. You know, When you start to see the coordination respond within their body, they're starting to see that their body is functioning better globally. Didi, I um, don't know if I'm muted or not. We hear you loud and clear. Uh, this is Dr. Barwell. There, there's one other aspect to this, too, that has been uh, very rewarding, and that's the, the aspect of, and all of us know this, when the, we're patients under care for a while and their signs and symptoms of their presenting problem are now eased off and they're feeling better, uh, they generally want to quit care. I mean, that's just the way people are, are trained. If you don't have symptoms, you're fine. One of the things that, that has been really revealing with all of the uh, stress response evaluations is that we can show them that even though their body has responded and they're no longer experiencing that discomfort, we can show them that the nervous system has not completely recovered yet. And so now we finally have objective proof for ongoing care. And that's, been, that's a huge factor because one of the things I discovered in my years of practice was we didn't give chiropractic enough time to help that system get back to a normal basis. What we were ending up doing is, is ending care when the signs and symptoms went away and then they just come back again in six months or eight months or whatever it may be. 
uh, and they'll be back in your office with the same pattern. When you have longer terms uh, with care going on with these people, you actually change, you alter that nervous system pattern, and they achieve a much higher level. Awesome. All right, uh, there is a question from Dr. Willis. Dr. Willis wants to know if many chiropractic te techniques work to improve the stress response, is it possible that any treatment or lack thereof, parenthetically placebo, would also get results if the patient believes it would? In other words, how do we make sure that chiropractic is the key as opposed to any stimulation? Um, Richard, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <clears throat> uh, yes, a couple of things here. We have also discovered that there is such a thing as a bad adjustment. And yeah. when chiropractors get all up in the air about me making a statement like this, I simply have to remind them of what it was like in their first couple of years at chiropractic college when they were being beat to death by their classmates. Um, some of the sickest years of my life, I know that. Uh, what we also demonstrated with the uh, ability to have people hooked up live time giving an adjustment is we can see when it's not working in the right direction, which means that either frequency, duration, or intensity should be changed. And that means you should have a, a bag of different approaches of different techniques, such as, you know, Ted Korn's specific uh, technique. It's a, it's a good technique. Um, that's one of them. Um, manual adjustment is obviously one of them because it gives you different opportunities for frequencies. So we can show whether it's good or bad, and that's, that's very important. But I also have to let you know that, you know, there is a human factor called hope, which is the, the greatest healer in the world. And when you can speak with confidence about what kind of care people need to be having that's, sort of, that's suited to them and their mom, the moment of challenge, uh, you can give them a lot of confidence in your address, and that makes a big difference. So hope does play a role in healing. Let me, let me just say one thing to add to that, Richard. You know, I have a patient uh, who came in, he was an older man, and, and when we did the stress response, part, the, part of the response is a, uh, is a exaggerated intentional relaxation exercise. So when we showed him his response, um, his, hand, his heart rate went up about 15 beats during the relaxation period. His hand temperature dropped almost 10 degrees, um, and his, hand, his, his um, hand sweatiness increased, all during a purposeful relaxation exercise. And the odd thing about that was, as I showed him this, he said, I don't understand. I've been meditating 45 minutes a day for the last 20 years. And I looked at him and I said, and you're also on all these medications. Why? Because your body's not doing what you think it's doing when you're doing the relaxation meditation that you're doing daily for 45 minutes. Your body's not responding appropriately. That's why you're still in the state you're in. So. That, that really triggered something within him. Yeah. And Dr. Willis, did that answer your question? And I'll give you a few seconds to type that in. Um, in the meantime, uh, the next question is, do you use any nutrition with the treatment program? Um, I, I do offer nutrition in the office, not nutritional counseling, but we do some nutritional intervention for those people who have um, things like cancer, people who have things like uh, severe autoimmune diseases. We do offer some nutritional intervention. Um, but that's not necessary. I would recommend it for anyone, but um, we do offer that, yes. It's not a mandatory thing for people, but we do offer it. Okay. The next question is, when the information is interpreted, how does this help me determine the type of adjustment um, that I give? I mean, you said earlier that it doesn't show you where to adjust, but um, how does it help me determine that? Depending on how the nervous system is functioning, if somebody is really, like I was saying before, like that individual, the example I gave of Linda, you know, here's an individual who their sympathetic system was so overly aroused, and when, for that two-year corrective care at another office that uh, they were receiving, you know, she, every time she got adjustment, she was blacking out. Well, when we did that, and she hadn't had a stress response prior to coming into this office. So when she came into the office, we did a stress response. And we we'll look at somebody whose baseline heart rate is 105, whose skin conduct is 27. We know she's, been, she's functioning in the red. So what we had to do was we actually had to back off that individual. So it really helped us understand who was actually on the table and how we could cater an adjustment that is going to allow her nervous system to receive it and not fight it. Um, so. When you're looking at, at the stress response, you can actually tell how fragile your system is or how receptive 
their, their system is to the treatment you're going to give them. Okay. Um, the next question is from Dr. Travis. It says, is there a place on your site to find doctors using this to see it in action and experience it? Um, Dr. Travis, we have not yet listed our clients on our website, but if you will let me know where you're located, I'll be happy to give you a referral to the closest one so that you can actually go experience it as well. Okay. Still typing going on. Hold on one second. All right. I recently just had an SRE done at a seminar, and it seemed like I was getting a lot of information. How do you quickly interpret this to the patient? Um, it, it's really not that hard. Um, when, I, when I talk to a patient, I say, listen, the three things we're looking at when we do an, a stress response, or in this case, I'm just going to call it a stimulation response, um, evaluation is, is your body doing what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it? In other words, when you relax, does your heart rate drop? Does your hand warm up? Do your hands dry off? Um, does your respiration slow down, et cetera, you know, as you're looking at several different things. So is everything doing what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it? Is your reaction proportionate to the stimulus? Like I said before, you know, we have a, a, a cyclist who, you know, cycles somewhere in the vicinity of 120 to 150 miles a week. He comes in here, and um, his resting heart rate is around 52, and when he closes his eyes to relax, his heart rate goes up to 132. So all of a sudden, that's a pretty drastic, drastic change. So that's not even a proportion response. I mean, that's just horrific. Um, and then lastly, when we take that stimulation away, does your body have the ability to come back down to a resting level? So if we stimulate you, your heart rate should increase a little bit. And when we take that stimulation away, your heart rate, as an example of one component, your heart rate should decrease. Now, we're not concerned with the heart rate per se. What we're concerned about is, does that nervous system have the ability to just coordinate that adaptation to a stimulus and to a recovery? The problem is not with the heart. The problem is with the controller, controlling mechanism and the coordinating mechanism of everything we're measuring. So that's how we explain it and people get it. It's literally that simple. Um, Dr. Merrick, do you want to chime in on that as far as your patient response when you give the report? Am I muted? You are not. Oh, jeez. So I should have stopped goofing around on my desk here is what you're telling me. Um, I, I like, I'm a bit of a geek. I really like to go into it with the patient, but I'm not going to do it with them right then. Um, uh, like Joe said, you can be very, very simplistic and say, look, you know, um, we did some tests and we can see that your central nervous system is not responding in a way that I would have hoped. That's a, a way that's going to be sustainable over time. I'd like to go over that with you in great detail, and I do this once a week. Uh, at what I call my doctor's report, and uh, probably have three or four people in the room, and we are going to go into this in great detail, and, and uh, it's fascinating, and you'll love it. Um, I get really good uh, um, uh, compliance to come to that meeting. Everyone loves it. I try to get done in 45 minutes or an hour, and everyone keeps me there for at least an hour and 15 minutes uh, asking lots of questions. And I guess, and, and I don't mean, I don't know who asked the question, and I, I don't mean to be, um, blunt about it, but there are different things that we can do that are very simple and don't have a lot of information involved and, you know, a leg check. That's simple and it's quick. Um, I really like the neuroinfinity because I'm not a simple and quick kind of a person. Uh, I, I really want to understand what's going on in the nervous system and I want to be able to, to really use that and leverage that um, both in terms of improving patient care and in engaging the patients uh, in wanting to improve their life expression. I'd like to add something to this, if I may. Uh, it, chiropractors tend to make everything so, so complicated. And when I'm giving the report, if I'm at one of these shows and I'm giving the report, I'm giving the report um, what I can seem to consider to be at the doctor's level. So I'm a little more technical than I really would be with a, a standard patient. For the standard patient, it would be basically um, a red circle around the areas that aren't normal, a green circle around the areas that are ideal, and, and we've done one chart up that's simply done, it prints that out in red and green, whether it's good or bad, just to keep it as simple as possible. We also have a sheet that goes with this that shows them the ideals, and, and so they can take that home and they can start to compare, and that's all they want to be able to do is they say, well, mine doesn't look like that. 
And when they have it in their hands, and they're going to start showing it to their friends and going like, look at this report I got, and here's what it should look like. And it does. See, I told you I was sick. You know, they just want to be just, they want to have it as simple as they can. And really, it doesn't have to be a long, drawn out. And I, for those, if I was the one giving the report, um, just remember I, I was talking to a doctor, and I, I make it a little more complicated because I want you to understand the importance of this when it comes to a chiropractic profession. Thank you. All right, and another question. Um, I've been practicing for several years talking uh, bone on nerve, as you call it. Uh, how do I make that transition or change that conversation in my practice? I don't think that's a hard endeavor. I think we have several people in the profession, several people are using the equipment now who, who made that transition. And it's, it's really not as hard as you think. I mean, if, if, if people are going to go around in your doctor's report, you're going to say bone on nerve, what are you ultimately saying? That that bone is interfering with mental information. But really what you're talking about at this stage, you're going to turn it up a notch and just basically say your, your nervous system still has the ability to the ability or inability to control and coordinate everything you're doing. And we as chiropractors are just using that spine as a portal of entry, as a gateway into that system. That's it. I mean, it's not a hard transition. And it's still very congruent with the philosophy of what chiropractic is about. You know, still subluxation based. We're just moving the subluxation technically sort of kind of, and this, this gets people's fur standing up on their shoulders too, it's just that it kind of takes the onus away from the spinal involvement of it and just more of a neurological subluxation. So instead of just the vertebral subluxation, we're going to talk more about the neurological subluxation, the greater subluxation. You know, it's kind of like when we talk about the stressors, you know, if you drink a, a two liter bottle of Coke, all of a sudden the bone isn't going to, you know, when you have a chemical stressor, the bone isn't going to pop out of alignment, then you start to get disease. That Coke and that, that is going to start to interfere with your neurological process and then in turn that's just going to screw up everything, including biomechanics because you're having a, a, a chemical neurological toxin in there. So it's still very consistent with where we're going, it's just a broader, a, a broader view of what chiropractic is about. Right. Right. There's another uh, statement. Um, Dr. Fr Dr. Frick, I have you unmuted. You want to ask that? You want to make that comment yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. I was just saying, as a also as a transition from uh, the bone on nerve model. I mean, simply a bone that is stuck out of place. Um, causes faulty input into into the brain central nervous system, which then causes faulty output, which is what you basically see on the uh, neuroinfinity uh, test. Real simple way. You're here. Very well said. Are there any more questions or comments? All right, I'll wait a few more seconds to see if there are any more that pop up. In the meantime, Dr. Barwell, do you want to um, just give a few closing statements? Yes, this is a time in this profession that uh, this is ripe. Uh, we, we have a lot of dissension going on within the profession, uh, not knowing which way to go. We, we have challenges going on in Europe where they really want to make us a physical therapist and nothing more. Um, we know that there's a challenge to the basic concepts of, of vertebral subluxation as cause. Uh, it's always been our challenge saying that the vertebral subluxation is the cause of disease rather than a symptom of a disordered nervous system that's truly the cause of disease. So this is a, an opportune moment for, for the profession to be able to look at something that while it sounds new and fresh really just goes back to our roots and talks about the things that both DD and BJ talked about when they didn't have the information we have today to be able to support this type of, of position. So it's, it's an exciting time, it's a refreshing time, and it's really a time for the profession to step forward and, and uh, stand behind something that really shows who we are, what we can do, and just how wonderful chiropractic really is. I'd like to thank all of you for being on today. I'd also like to extend a thanks to Dr. Ted Corrin. Um, I know that Ted just welcomed us with open arms at one of his seminars, and we did some live time work with it. And I've always enjoyed working with Ted, and uh, I look forward to working with him in the future. 
And if Ted, if you happen to be on, um, remember that university is still waiting for you to start. All right. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody again. All right. Uh, and with that, we'll end the webinar. There haven't been any new questions. Um, Dr. Joe, if you could advance the slide uh, one or two more. I'll show the contact information up there. And therefore, anyone who wants to see um, or contact us, you can go to um, www.neuroinfinity.com, or you can uh, call us at 877-233-0022. We look forward to hearing your questions and comments, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you on another uh, Neuroinfinity webinar in the near future. Um, everybody, thanks for attending, and have a great day.